Good evening, everyone. So, is this your first time? That question was given to me by six women in a room, which is something I, in a way, had always dreamed of, but had never dreamed that it would happen in an operating room. <clears throat> You've heard from several doctors tonight. You're going to hear from a patient now about my experiences. My experiences you know, have to do with heart procedures. The CDC uh, published that 735,000 people have heart attacks every year. 525 of those are first-time heart attacks. That means that roughly 210,000 have a second heart attack. So there's either something really great about a heart attack or something doesn't change in their lifestyle that allows them to, to avoid it. Sometimes it's unavoidable, but a lot of times it is. My experience after the surgery was very difficult. I had depression. I had anxiety. Um, I had a hard time at work where I could only work for a few hours that I'd sneak out to my car to sleep in order to gain energy to go back. And, and so my, my experience was very different than a lot of people that have different heart procedures, whether it be an angioplasty or an open heart or what have you. Certainly some are harder than others, but mine was very different. And, and, and so uh, I became very interested in that topic of how you change. And, but let, let's go back 14 years, okay? I was 40 years old. I was diabetic, I was overweight, and the recession hit the city of Detroit. You know, we all remember what that was like. We all took pay cuts. We all took layoffs, whatever it might be. And I made a decision in that I was going to give up golf because that was the most expensive thing that I did, and I needed to kind of rejuvenate my family budget. Golfing, it's an expensive sport. It's a drinking sport. It's an eating sport, and you don't eat well. And then it's a gambling sport on top of it. So by giving up golf, I could get rid of a lot of bad habits, I hung up my golf shoes and I bought a pair of running shoes and I started running. I joined a club, had some great experiences, but as I ran, my sugar levels, my numbers, didn't lower the way I wanted them to, so I started to run marathons. And I ran my first marathon and I got the miles in and I had a great experience. When I came back from that experience, I set a goal and that was to run a marathon in every continent. Okay. It's a crazy goal for a 40-year-old man um, with all these health problems, but I did the one thing that really made it happen. I told people. So once you tell somebody, you're committed. You're either the guy that said it and didn't do it, or you're the guy that said it and did it. What do you want to be, right? So I told people. That was the way I got myself to do it. I was going to run marathons in all seven continents. The first continent that I went to was, was uh, South America. I went to Brazil and ran the Rio de Janeiro Marathon. And for those of you that have ever run a race, you finish and you just feel great, like you've conquered the world. I was with a friend and we said, okay, what's next? And we sat down at the computer and we signed up to run a marathon in Antarctica. It's a four-year waiting list, okay? And it, and it cost about $10,000. And so it's a big expense, so you don't want to do it all the time, right? <laughs> so, so we signed up for Antarctica. And, um, and by the, between the time I ran Rio and the time that I was going to run Antarctica, I spent the years in between traveling around the world running marathons. Besides the few that I did here in North America, I ran the Tokyo Marathon. I ran the London Marathon. I ran the Australian Outback Marathon, and I ran the Safaricom Marathon in Kenya on a 68,000-acre wildlife preserve. I had just amazing experiences, and when that was done, I got home, and it was time to train for Antarctica. Now, we're pretty lucky here in Michigan from a runner's perspective, training for the coldest climate you can run in. Michigan's pretty cold. So I had, a, I had a nice advantage over the people from California and Arizona. You know, when I met up with them, they were freezing. But I was like, yeah, this is really not that big a deal to me, being from Michigan. But during the course of my training, I noticed that I wasn't feeling right. You know, my breathing wasn't right. My energy wasn't right. And the thing about runners is we know our body. 
right? We know when a muscle's, a muscle's pulled. We know when a toenail's not right because we pay attention to these things. And, and it was not only noticeable to me, it was noticeable to my friends and to my coaches and, and the people I trained with. And, and so I did the right thing. I went to the doctor probably about a month and a half before I was set to leave for Antarctica. And my doctor did the right thing. He said, Mike, go get a stress test. So I went and got a stress test. I was on the treadmill. And what did they say? Ah, oh, you're a marathon runner. You're fine. And they passed me with flying colors. I went back to my doctor and I said, something's not right. And he said, look, you passed your stress test. You know you're going to be OK. You're not going to have a heart attack in Antarctica. Because if there's one place in the world you don't want a heart attack, it's in Antarctica. There are no hospitals. There, there's a doctor on the ship, but, but you can't depend on that ship doctor to, to, to revive you that far from home. So, um, so I, I had the stress test, and, uh, and I passed it, so I went to Antarctica. Um, I had a plan. And my plan, because I knew my condition wasn't, what, wasn't that good, that I was going to run the first half and then walk run the second half. Pretty typical for those of you that know uh, ultra marathoners, they do the same thing. They, if it looks like a hill, you walk up it and then you run down it. And that was kind of my strategy. Um, but I didn't realize how hard the trip would be. We, we meet up in Argentina and we take um, a, a ship to Antarctica. And for those of you that have ever been on a cruise, like a Princess Cruise Line, it's nothing like that. It's a 300-foot-long Russian research vessel that holds 100 people. Two and a half days through the Drake Passage, 30-foot swells, it's throwing the boat around like a boat in the bathtub, right? I mean, just to and fro. And I could only function about two, two and a half hours before I would need to go lay down and re-energize myself because it was that strenuous and stressful to, to, you know, to, to make that journey. So... We get, to, we get to Antarctica, and we're about to run the race. You know, for those of you who don't know, a marathon's 26.2 miles, right? And, um, and they said, OK, what we're going to do is we're going to run from Russia to China. Sounds like 26 miles to me. In reality, it was 2.17 miles that you had to repeat 12 times. 12 times through the same identical hills, and, and it's the same height going in either direction. Uh, rocky terrain, snowy terrain, penguin guano on the path, ice, everything you can imagine. But it was a great experience, and it, and it worked out the way I thought it would. I ran the first half, and then I walked ran the second half. If you don't finish a marathon within a certain time, they take you off the course. And they do that in, in most races, and certainly in Antarctica. And they do it because of time, and they do it because of weather conditions. But you know, I was thrilled that I was actually able to complete the marathon. Right, An amazing thing for a guy my age uh, to do that. Um, and, uh, and what a great experience. And, and I got back to the ship, kind of showered and rested, and then we had a big celebration. And it was fantastic. There were 12 people that weekend. They had actually two boats with 100 runners each, and 12 people had run their seventh continent. So at the time, there was about 500 people that had done that. And so it's a big deal you know, for us celebrating. It doesn't, look like a, it doesn't feel like a big deal now that I've done it. Um, but back then, I was pretty excited about it. And uh, um, I, you know, I, I, I rested, and then I came back to Detroit. But when I got back to Detroit, my health hadn't changed. I had just done this and accomplished this, but it was back to square one. I went back to my doctor, who's a marathoner and a triathlon uh, athlete in his own right, and he said, oh, we're going to go through some tests. I went to a pulmonary specialist, because that's where my problems were, and the pulmonary doctor was thrilled to see me, a marathoner. He, he, he told me, I usually deal with smokers. This is fantastic. You pass with flying colors. I went to an allergist, pass with flying colors. So at my insistence, because I listened to my body, I went back for a nuclear stress test where they inject a dye and they look at your cardiovascular system. And they found a 95% blockage in my LAD artery, which is also referred to as the widow maker. Right? And so for those of you that are familiar with this, 95% blockage is pretty close to having the big one, right? And having that big heart attack. And, and, and so uh, back to my original question, 
is this your first time? It's not like, is this your first time to Hawaii? You know, is this your first time at the, at the carnival? No, they asked me, is this your first time in the hospital having an angioplasty? That meant to me that a lot of people come back for more. They see people three, four, and five times. And, and if you talk to people that have had the procedure, you'll find out a lot of them have had multiple procedures over their life. And so that scared the crap out of me. That really scared me. I don't want to come back you know, to do this. And so um, the doctor called me in 20 minutes after I had my stress test and said, we want to operate in the next 48 hours. What a wake-up call. I got to get my affairs in order. I got to you know, tell my wife where the insurance is. I got to pay the dry cleaner. I got to do all these things that you do in your normal life, but you don't want to leave it if, in case something really terrible happens, and it does happen. And, and so um, I had the procedure, and it was successful. And I'm very grateful to the hospital for, for, for having a successful surgery. But you know, when I think about the, the education that I got and the preparation that I got, it was really insufficient <coughs> because after the procedure, my recovery was slow, and it was difficult, and I had a lot of side effects to the medication. And I had no idea that that was coming. Like everybody else, when you're diagnosed with something, you do a lot of Google research. Probably the most dangerous thing you can do, <laughs> right? Oh my gosh, all these things that can happen, good, bad, whatever, but you don't get all the right information. You don't get all the information that you really need to properly recover, to properly change your lifestyle, why it happened. When I was leaving the hospital, a nurse came in for no more than five minutes. These are your meds. You take one in the morning. You take one twice a day. Make sure you pay your bill on the way out. Boom. That was it. About a week later, I got a phone call saying, are you interested in cardiac rehab? It's about an hour, hour and a half from your house. I'm like, you know, I'm a busy person. I don't know that I can do that. And they said, you know what? You're a marathoner. You'll be fine. You don't need a dietitian. You don't need cardiac rehab. You'll be OK. Well, you know what? I wasn't OK. You know, I, I, I really needed support, and I didn't know enough to ask for it. So the, the key thing is education. <clears throat> there are standards and procedures that are in place at a lot of hospitals. I'm now, I now go to the Cleveland Clinic, and I've done research at U of M on this topic. And there are standards and procedures in order to prep not only the patient, but the family on what you're about to experience. Certainly, you know, the you know, overview of the procedure, the preparation, recovery, medication, what to do if something's not right, but importantly, rehabilitation and diet. Because those are the two things that are about lifestyle change. And here, I was a marathoner. I exercised, I ran 50 miles a week, but yet, you know, I, I was having these problems. And so I didn't have those resources really at my fingertips to make those changes. The thing about education and preparation, it's about knowledge. It's about knowledge. And, and the knowledge reduces anxiety. It gives you comfort. It demystifies it. But most importantly, it helps you become a patient advocate. You know what the procedure is. You know the questions to ask. You know what to do if the medications have a negative side effect. You know how to make changes to your lifestyle, what the next steps are. And so if I would have had maybe that education that was structured and formalized in a notebook that I could refer to, um, I would have been much better off. It took me two years to recover, two years of trying different medicines. It took six months to get the doctor to change one of my meds, right? And then they change one but not the other. Two years to change my diet. I'm now gluten-free, dairy-free, egg-free, processed sugar-free, and, and there's probably a, a list of other things that I don't do anymore that I enjoyed. You know, like beer and alcohol, you know, that's, I sneak a little bit. But for the most part, I really changed my diet, right, to fit the change in lifestyle that I required. 
bottom line, bottom line, is recovery shouldn't be a marathon. You want your recovery to be a sprint. You want to get in, get out, get better, and move on with your life, but change your lifestyle so you'll be here for a long time. That's the goal. Thank you very much.